you would turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 17. <clears throat> I included the entire chapter of John chapter 17 in this message this morning, and we will see as um, Al run in, runs into most times, the hardest part about this whole process is figuring out timing of what you want to get across, and within the 25 minutes that we have left. So you know, I always give Al a hard time because we get halfway through and then he starts paging through all his pages to get to the end. So I always know. So if you see me doing that, I learned from, from the best you know how to do that. Um, so anyway, we are going to go through um, the chapter of chapter 17 of the Gospel of John. And I'd like to kind of give you an an idea of how my message or my sermon comes together, mostly because it's kind of amazing how the Holy Spirit works. Amen. When I first was looking at John chapter 17, I was kind of coming at it from a whole different other rabbit trail I had gone down. I had gone through a devotional and I thought I wanted to preach on a certain theme, and I had listened to a couple online sermons and got to the chapter, chapter 17 of John, and as I was studying it, going through it as a reference text, this idea of being a gift kept coming to me, and I kind of revamped everything that I was going to do and wrapped it around this idea. Have you ever thought of yourself as a gift? You are a gift. Some of you are thinking, well, that's kind of arrogant, but I'm, I'm not that special. Um, but I want you to really think about this um, in that ter those terms. And it wasn't only um, looking at this from guiding of the Holy Spirit, but if you look through this, pas this passage, um, and I think I counted correctly, so if you get bored later on in the, the, this message, you can check my math by counting up. But the word give or gave is used nine times in this passage, and the word given is used another nine times. So we have 18 references to give or gave or given in this passage in Scripture. So it's a really um, prominent theme that comes out of chapter 17 of John. And I, I kind of wanted to look at this from the perspective also of when we look at ourselves as a gift, we are looking at our identity, our value. And I think in our society today, that's a pretty important thing. For those of you who don't know, I teach my day job, my real job is uh, teaching high school math at a 100% online charter school. And we deal a lot with students, we're up to 225 students I think now, and it's all students from all over Iowa. And I deal a lot with students who have fallen through the cracks. They have dropped out of school, disappeared from the school system altogether. Now they're trying to come back online to get their diploma. And they've disappeared because of things like anxiety, bullying, um, all those things that go to, who am I? Where do I fit into this world? And I struggle with how much, at a public school, I can express to them that value, your identity, lies in that you are a gift. You are created in the image of God. So I wanted to come at it a little bit from that perspective also. But when we look at the idea of a gift, I talked about it being maybe a little bit arrogant a little bit ago, and I think that comes from our fallen human nature, our sinful nature. When we look at a gift, we automatically, in our sinful nature, look at value. My daughter's I've got one daughter that's a freshman in college, almost finished. It's their last week, so she'll be with us next Sunday, hopefully. Um, and I have another daughter that's married with two two kids, and they are either looking forward to the the situation where all of their friends are getting engaged, or they've just been through that. And so I've heard them talking over the years when they talk about a friend that's gotten engaged. What's the first question that they ask each other? How big is the ring? <laughs> How much did he spend on her? So we automatically look at gifts with value. And I can't just throw my kids under the bus, I guess. Um, I do the same thing. I, my son-in-law, Ben, is a CPA, as many of you have met him. 
Um, in the last few years, he's been doing our taxes. And I always ask him, well, how much do you want me to pay you for that? And he's like, well, you do enough for us. Don't worry about it. So I've been trying to give, give him a gift instead. But being the, as Dutch as I am, I want to value that gift as, <laughs> well, I used to pay $150 to get our taxes done. So maybe we'll give a gift about that much instead of just giving the gift. So we, we attach value to the, the idea of a gift. So when we look at this idea of that you are a gift, we need to look at you are a gift from God the Father to God the Son. God gave you as a gift to his Son. So if we look at that value, how do we value that? What's our value as that gift? Well, if we look at the service that was rendered to gain that gift, we look at the service that was rendered was Jesus living a perfect life and dying on the cross in our place and suffering for us. So really, I should have put in there, we are a Christless gift that we were given from God the Father to God the Son. So let's read through these verses in chapter 17. And if you want to follow along in your Bibles, we're going to go break this down kind of verse by verse here in a little bit, and I'll have those up here, but right now we'll just go through from start to finish. So chapter 17, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I, have, I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I, I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may, tru may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who, who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. <clears throat> Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself we have these beautiful words 
from Jesus himself. And if we take a 10,000 foot view of the setting of what's going on here, how many of you have heard of this passage described as the high priestly prayer? Okay, a couple of you. Um, what does that really mean? Is that an accurate description? I think it's a very accurate description. What did the high priest do? What was the high priest's job in the Old Testament? The high priest's job was to be the intercessor, the mediator between the Israelite people and God himself. And that is what Jesus is doing through this plan of salvation that he is about to execute here on earth. He is our mediator. He is our intercessor. And this is a one, um, a wonderful picture of that with Jesus' words. So, um, how many of you have the Lord's Prayer memorized? A few more hands. Okay. That's a wonderful thing to memorize scripture, to know that. And we memorize that because Jesus told us this is a pattern of how we should pray. I may want to maybe make the case this morning that this um, passage or parts of this passage we should commit to memory also. It's that important, it's that beautiful, it's that much of an encompassing of the plan of salvation that Jesus executed. Um, has, have any of you heard of Philip Melanchthon? Philip Melanchthon is one of the reformers. He was a contemporary of Martin Luther. He's not as well known. Him and Martin Luther exchanged letters quite a bit, and they influenced each other's beliefs quite a bit. But this is how Philip Melanchthon, in his last message, his last sermon, described this um, chapter 17 of John, this prayer that we have in front of us. He said, There is no voice which has ever been heard, either in heaven or on earth, more exalted, more holy, more fruitful, more sublime than the prayer offered by the Son to God himself. So he describes this prayer, there's nothing more exalted, there's nothing we can put higher on a pedestal, there's nothing more holy, there's nothing more set apart for, for its perfection, nothing more fruitful, nothing more beneficial to us, and nothing more sublime. Sublime isn't a word that we use very much anymore, but a synonym is awesome, and awesome is used probably too much, it's, it's um, pack isn't, isn't there anymore, but something is, if something is full of awe, um, our jaw drops when we read it. And that's what we should look feel when we look read through this passage is the awesomeness of it. And part of that is because we have kind of a unique situation here where we have Jesus, the Son, praying to God the Father. It's kind of an interesting scenario if we think about that and we think through that. But let's take a look at more of the setting. When is this happening in Jesus' ministry? Jesus has just had the Passover meal with his disciples. His last Passover meal. He knows exactly what's happening in the future, correct? So, then he goes into um, teaching or preaching to his disciples, to the, the ones he loved, his closest inner circle. He teaches them. And I wanted to read, um, if you have, still have your Bibles open, if you back up a verse to chapter 16, verse 33, that is the end of this teaching that, that Jesus is, is giving to his disciples. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Some amazing words there from Jesus also. He's his last really teaching, formal teaching session with his disciples he is looking at it as he wants to give, bring them peace. He wants to give them confidence. And he's speaking in past tense. He's overcome the world. It's already done. He knows it's happening. We look at God and, and Jesus himself, and time doesn't matter to them because they know um, the future. So after this teaching, Jesus goes to prayer. Now we look at this situation and we look at it as Jesus, who is 100% God and 100% man, and he knows exactly what is about to happen. And he chooses to take this point in time and pray to God, the Father. Why? 
Why pray at this point? Well, we can ask ourselves, why do we pray? I remember back to when I was going through this, thinking about this. I remember years and years ago, we were um, I was leading a Bible study here. I think we were meeting up here for some reason. We were, um, everybody was sitting in the pews, and I was standing up front, and we were talking about prayer. And um, somewhat being the devil's advocate, somewhat being halfway serious, I said, well, why do we pray? God knows everything that's going to happen. He knows um, what we're going to ask for even before we ask it. He knew what we were going to ask for today before the beginnings of the world. So why do we pray? And Glenn Vanderskill raised his hand and said, because God wants us to. And it's even more than that. He commands us to, right? Uh, we're, we're actually going to um, study this a little bit today after the, the pop providence. Um, we're going to do a session on prayer. And we've been studying a book by R.C. Sproul. And R.C. Sproul even calls it a duty to pray. And that's what we should think about prayer as. It's a duty that we need to perform. God wants us to perform it. One quote that I, I read as I was going through this um, is that God wants us to express to him in prayer our knowledge of him and his plan for our salvation. So God wants us to express to him that we understand who he is and his plan of salvation in our lives. He knows everything, but he still wants us to express that to him. So really, this passage is divided up into three sections. And um, I already see the clock moving forward here, and I've rambled too long. And actually, these, these should probably be put into three separate messages. <laughs> Verses 1 through 5 talks about um, Jesus praying for himself. Verses 6 through 19, he is praying specifically for his disciples. And then verses 20 through 26, he extends this out to all of us. And he connects everything that he has been praying for, for specifically for his disciples, and extends that to all believers. So let's dive into this a little bit here, and I'm going to probably go way too quickly, but that's okay. You're, I'm a teacher, so I can give you homework, so your homework will be to <laughs> dive into this deeper as you go throughout your personal devotions throughout the week. <clears throat> so, we begin here with verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. What is the purpose? And I labeled this as purpose. What is the, pur the real purpose for God's plan of salvation for us? It is to glorify himself, right? And in the process, glorify Jesus, his son. And in the process, we gain eternal life. Verse 2, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Here is our first reference to given. We are given to Christ, and God has give, granted him the authority over all people, but that authority to grant eternal life to us who were given as the gift. Pretty amazing process, a pretty amazing thing um, that he's doing here. So this is also the purpose and the plan of what Jesus is fulfilling. Verse 3, now this is eternal life. So what is this eternal life? that Jesus has been granted authority to give to us as the gift. This, eter this eternal life is that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And here we need to go back to what Al's been talking about quite a bit here lately from this very pulpit, the idea of know, that they know you. Does that just mean, like Al said, knowing who you are, knowing things about you? No, it's way more than that. It's experiencing God. So this eternal life is knowing, experiencing the only true God, and experiencing, knowing in that way, Christ his Son, whom God the Father sent. Verse 4, 
And before we go to verse 4, if you an interesting note here, if you look at these first three verses, Jesus is talking in the third person. He's talking about himself as Jesus Christ. Then we get to verse 4, and Jesus makes a switch. And now he starts talking about I in the first person. I think theologians have discussed this a lot and argued about this. I think this is a wonderful picture of Christ's 100% deity and 100% humanity. In these same five or six verse, five verses, he goes from third person talking about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ is doing, and then he goes to I. Verse 4, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. He's talking in the past tense here, right? I brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. I brought. It's already done. He's already finished the work. Verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus is looking forward to being at the right hand of God the Father again, like he was before the world began, before the beginnings of the world, before we brought sin into this world. And so that's what he's looking forward to, ruling at the right hand of God the Father in this verse. Um, another quote that I, I looked at, God's salvation plan is kind of like God the Father gives his authority to a man so that if he obeys perfectly, that obedience can be transferred to those whom God gave to him. This was kind of a, a definition or a, a description of what this plan really looks like of salvation. God the Father gives his authority to a man so that if he obeys perfectly this man, that obedience can be transferred to those whom God gave to him as a gift. And we look at this, we look at that as man, but the only way that that can happen, right, is if this man is also fully God. Jesus is the only one that can do this. This can, this, I have a typo there, I'm sorry. This plan can only be carried out by one man, Jesus, who is also God. Okay? A picture of this process, this purpose. Verse 8, <clears throat> or 6, I'm sorry. Um, in this passage, it, it, it um, kind of changes a little bit. Jesus isn't talking about himself now. He is talking specifically to his disciples, or for his disciples, and praying for them. And I, I, um, I had another quote that, um, what was that? I lost it, but it was talking about God is praying um, for his disciples to this God. Um, and it, it, it's a picture of what Jesus does for us. He wants to pray for us, knowing everything that's going to transpire. transpire. Um, verse 6, I revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have <laughs> obeyed my word. Here's this picture of the gift that we are from God the Father, to God the Son. Um, so this last little phrase, they have obeyed your word. What does this mean? We would consider ourselves as this gift. Do we obey completely? Are we perfect? Is that why we were chosen as this gift? No. He can say these words because his obedience is transferred to us, the ones that were chosen as the gift. Verse 7, now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. All pointing back to God the Father again. This whole plan, the purpose is to glorify God the Father. God the Father. <coughs> Verse 8, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Belief doesn't necessarily equal perfection. We waver in our belief at times, but we truly believe because we have the Holy Spirit guiding us in us that Jesus was sent 
to save us. Verse 9. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those <coughs> you have given me, for they are yours. Does this raise the hair on the back of your neck a little bit? In this society we live in, where fairness is the ultimate um, thing that we compare everything to? These are Jesus' words. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. A lot of people will have a tough time with this, this verse, but we need to keep it in perspective that a lot of people will look at this as, well, it's, it's unfair for God to only save some, to only choose some, to only have some as a gift and some not. But we need to look at the, this from the perspective of None of us deserve it, right? So isn't it amazing and wonderful that he chooses some? That he gives that and chooses some as that gift that he gives to Jesus Christ, his son. Verse 10. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. The them here is the disciples. Even the disciples who are sinful bring glory to God through Christ Jesus the Son. Their work and their ministry brings glory to God also. Verse 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is looking forward again here to that time when he's going to be ruling at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus' time on earth as a man is coming to an end, but he prays for the protection of those that he leaves behind, specifically his disciples and extended to um, the, uh, all of us. I see that we're running out of time here. I'm going to jump forward here to verse 20. So there's your homework. You go through verses 12 through 19 in depth. Um, verse 20 here we have another switch and I, I feel comfortable with jumping forward because these are the same things that are extended these things in verses 20 through 26 are the same things that are extended from what he's talking about and what he's asking for for his disciples to us as all believers so verse 20 kind of expresses that my prayer is not for them alone meaning the, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Ultimately, we believe through the message of his disciples, through God's holy word that he is giving us. So this, these requests from God the Son to God the Father are extended to us as believers also. Verse 21 and 22, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Us being one with Jesus Christ and God the Father? That's going to be an amazing thing. Um, verse 23. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Another picture of Jesus as mediator. Um, I saw a Venn diagram where it had a small circle with us, and then a bigger circle with Jesus, and then a bigger circle with God, the Father. Um, I'm not sure that's a perfect representation of that, but it's, it's an idea that uh, we are in Jesus, who is in God the Father, and it's just a wonderful picture of that unity that we are brought into, not because of what we've done, but as a gift from God. Verse 24, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. That idea of seeing Jesus' glory I don't know about you, but um, I can't wait for that to happen. I can't wait to see that. What an amazing thing that's going to be when we are able to see the glory of Jesus Christ. 
Verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. We can only know the holy and perfect God the Father through Christ as a mediator. We are unable to do that in and of ourselves. That's the only way we can know, and, and looking at that idea of know again as experience, we can only experience a holy and perfect God the Father through Christ as mediator. We have to have Christ acting as the high priest. We, we are not worthy of approaching the throne of God the Father without Jesus Christ as our mediator. And then verse 26, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and I myself may be in them. Does Jesus leave this by saying, I'm finished with my work here, I'm going to reign at the right hand of God the Father, and I'm finished here? No, he remains in us, and that's where he leads his Holy Spirit to live in us and to work in us, to work that sanctifying work of us becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus has gone back to be at the right hand of the Father, but continues to make himself, and in turn, God the Father known or experienced by the third person of the Trinity living in each one of us, which we will remember and commemorate here soon when we, when we remember Pentecost. So we, we commemorate that here coming up with Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was, was officially left behind to live in us. I want to end with these words again from chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus ends his prayer here, but I think these words in, of the, at the end of his teaching really help us to understand this also. So I want to go back to that if you still have your Bibles open. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Jesus' goal for us here on earth as a gift that he was given is for us to have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. Right away, from peace to, I guarantee you're going to have trouble. It kind of seems like it conflicts each other, right? But the only way we can have peace is to understand, he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's where that peace comes from. That's where the confidence comes from that we can get up tomorrow morning, go to our jobs or in our families, and be the hands and feet of Jesus to um, exclaim the joy that we have to those around us and explain how this work of salvation has gone in our lives. That we are a gift given to Jesus by God himself for this work of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you at the end of this service, and we just thank you for this time together again, this fellowship that we can have. We pray that we will have a wonderful time as we break bread and eat together now in our pot providence. We thank you for the, just the blessings of the food that we have, the, the, the luxuries that we have, the opportunities to spend this time together. Please help us to um, make that family unit of this congregation closer as we fellowship and break bread together. We pray that you will you will be glorified. We thank you for this, this plan of salvation that you executed um, by giving us as a gift to your son and him living a perfect life in our place and dying a horrific death on the cross in our place also, that we might have this eternal life of knowing you as true God and Christ Jesus as your true son. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to guide us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be alive in our hearts and will speak to us as we continue to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.